Okay, nice to meet everyone here for it. This is our second webinar, so hopefully you'll all be able to hear me. As yep. we go uh, if you have any questions as we go along, what we recommend is you put some comments in the chat box as we go through, but we'll be having regular stoppages on the way through uh, for people to ask questions as we go along. We're still waiting for a few other people to join us. So as and when, I might have to just add them in as we go along. With us. So my name's Matthew Palazok. I work for Northamptonshire Sport as the Community Sports Development Officer. Uh, I'm not sure whether she's here yet, but my colleague Jackie Brown, who is the Sport and Physical Activity Manager, should be joining us as well as we go through this webinar. So a bit of housekeeping. Uh, as always, we're reliant on IT to keep us going. So if possible, turn off your webcams for it there, but if not, doesn't matter. We are recording this to put onto our website uh, for it. And all supporting slides will be sent out after the webinar to you and some supporting documents for it. So as we go through, a few useful contacts for you. The Sport England have set up a dedicated email address to support clubs and organisations who may need help through this time. So that's coronavirus at sportengland.org uh, or my email address, which is matthew.palazok at firstforwellbeing.co.uk. There. Um, what we recommend is, if you're going to begin in touch with Sport England, if you CC myself in, I may be able to help you quicker than they can on certain areas of the support as they go through. They have a small team that is extremely busy at the moment supporting organisations with their funding that's taking place for it. So Sport England have set aside £195 million to support the sector at this moment in time. Uh, 55 million of that we have limited information on, but we are expecting an announcement sometime soon. That's part of the innovation funding. The 110 million pound or 115 that is rollover of current spending from this year into next year. And that's through partners already funded. And the, 10, the 20 million pound is part of the emergency funding that a lot of organisations across the county and country that have already applied for. We'll be going through some of the information around the emergency funding. That might be why quite a few of you have joined us today to discuss. Um, so as part of the funding, organisations and sports clubs are able to apply between 300 and 10,000 pounds to support their club through this time where they've had loss of earnings uh, or had to make outlays during this time. In some circumstances, they may pay out more than 10,000, but that is extremely unlikely uh, and it has to be an extremely big case for that to happen. The time frame for the funding has to be income that you've lost or had to pay out between the 1st of March 2020 and the 31st of July 2020. Uh, as you might be applying before then, you have to project your losses on that for it. So, who is eligible to uh, apply for this funding? As you can see, it's, it's quite a big sector that is eligible to apply. So lo you, if you're a local sports club, voluntary, voluntary or community sector, small charitable trust, or league and associations there. So I think a few of you might be involved in the managing and administration of leagues. So is that something you can apply for and look into as well? And then we've got the ineligible organisations on the right hand side there as we look at it. So some of the key areas that, you, that they will fund. So if you've had to pay out rent to facilities that you haven't been able to negotiate uh, the cancellation of the tenancy on or the agreement, then you can apply for that. 
you will have ongoing utility costs that you'll be paying on facilities and insurance costs. You can look to uh, apply for that to be covered during this time. And if you have any core staffing costs that can't be funded through other government schemes, you can apply for that to be covered there. But you very much have to look at other government funded schemes before you can apply to the Sport England costs. There, part of their uh, application will be your justification why you haven't applied to other government schemes for this. And what can't be funded is looking at new activities or events that you are putting on during this time or post this time. It has to be losses made during those three month or the four month period of March, April, May, and June as we go through there. So looking at some of the, uh, the fund criteria, it's been split down into some priority areas. So disadvantaged groups, including those in rural deprivation, uh, those that work with underrepresented groups within our society, which we'll come on to in a second, those that cannot get cover for staffing costs from government schemes. Um, looking at what have you delivered in the last 12 months. So it's very much for established organisations that are members of the community there. How have you been staying in touch with your participants? What have you been doing, whether that's through social media, whether that's through emails, phone calls to your participants to check that they're some of the most vulnerable in society have been kept engaged? and that you can demonstrate clear financial needs as a result of the current situation. So a top tip we, we put is if your organisation has a high percentage of members in an underrepresented group, really spell that out in your application. So whether that's a women and girls section within your team, a group uh, that work with disabled participants, really make that clear that they're some of the groups that are going to be strongly hit through these times there. So looking at some of the other priority areas, what we recommend is that you search on the internet for areas of deprivation to, to look through where some of your member base come from and where your club is po uh, positioned within that. Because if you've got a high number of members that come from deprived areas or low socioeconomic areas, then there's a good chance your organisation will be able to be supported through this funding. If you have a large number of older participants within your club, you really look at justifying how you're going to be supporting those and the need for them to be physically active, whether that is in the traditional club setting off the back or because of social distancing and their lockdown, how are you going to be supporting them to keep active if they can't get out of the house to your club uh, once lockdown finishes? So it's worth having a good deep look into what your organisation offers and how you're going to, uh, on why you need to be supported to keep them active. So the priority will be given to those that demonstrate clear financial hardship and a need as a result of the current situation. Clear details of the expected financial impact over the next three months the minimum expenditure you will have to meet while activity is happening, information about the reserves that you have unrestricted there. So some of the key areas, as one of our top tips, if you have reserves in your bank account, don't feel like you can't apply for it. All good clubs should have a running reserves. It's where you might have in some of your minutes of meetings where you've allocated and ring fenced some of those fundings for expenditure really spell that out during your application so they know why you're carrying those reserves if they are significant. Have a look through previous bank statements or uh, accounts from previous years to show where you might be looking to expend your finances during that time period. There. So look through and clearly explain the consequences of not receiving that funding. 
not just to your club, but to that wider community of members you support as you go along for it? Because there could be the, some of those family members that rely on your sporting organisation for that time away, for, the, for that social cohesion, not just the physical. For the... So currently, the Sport England applications are predominantly coming from traditional sports clubs and organisations. But I think we've got a few with us today, which are from that wider community, which is great to see until you're looking to support by applying to this funding. Uh, and some of the reasons why they've identified that some of the other organisations aren't applying is they don't know about the funding, don't think it's for them, or they're busy supporting in other ways, whether that's delivering hot meals, medicines within their community. So what we're going to be doing next week from Northampton Sport is ringing out and emailing sports clubs that we've identified in priority areas to be looking to support them through their application process. What that doesn't mean is if you're uh, not in the priority areas for Sport England, then we're not here to support you as you go through this. So when you apply, if you have a question, feel free to email me, call me to discuss it as we go through there. Because if you're thinking a question, most likely someone else who's gone through the process will have thought the same question. And we might have other contacts within Sport England. We can get answers to your questions without having to wait for someone within their grant application team to get back to you, which could take a couple of days on that. So, as of about an hour ago, when I had a look, there's been 7,814 submissions to, for funding, and just under 13 million of that, of the 20 million, has been allocated. So that's a high percentage of the money has already gone, and that is a 48-hour delay, so we could probably add another million onto that as of today. Boy. So across Northamptonshire, just under £200,000 of support has come into the sector since the funding application started there. We've broken it down into the different areas. So you can see it's a quite high percentage of success rate uh, going on. And that is two, just under 200000 And there's another 43 applications from the county that are going to be uh, assessed. So we could probably add another 100,000 onto that of the money that's come into the county to support you. So the extra 55 million is money that we're expecting to be released to support and stimulate the sector when we come out of lockdown. It'll be funds to accelerate the good ideas that you might already be thinking and making them happen, whether that is the increase in IT sessions, virtual sessions, looking at ways you can promote your, sector, your sessions to new, act, to new partners as we go forward there and funds get the sector back onto its feet, whether that's looking to increase the volunteer base because some volunteers don't come back to your organisation, uh, looking to recruit in new members, but we're hoping to see details of that over the next coming weeks. Boy. So I'm hoping Jackie is with us and might be able to unmute herself. Northampton Swimming Club have applied for some funding and were successful. And she might be able to talk us through some of the questions that Sport England came back with. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I am online. Um, we, we only heard last week that um, we were successful. Um, so we, we applied, I think, in the second week about a week after. I don't know if Jackie's here. Is Andy, are you there from Northampton? Hello. Hello. Yeah, Jackie is here. I can hear her speaking. I'm here as well. Are you? We can't hear you, Andy. Hello. Are you? Oh, I'm Jackie. Hello, I am here. Can everybody hear me or not? Yeah, yes, I can hear. Yeah. 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 Apologies, I had my laptop on mute. That'd be why. <laughs> Oh, sorry about that. Okay, um, so 
we we applied for funding within um i think it was the second week that it after it had been announced and um it isn't massively onerous but I, and i think everything that martin has said is is right you have to talk about the groups that you you um deliver to or are members of your organization and um and the onerous part of that is um certainly for us was was going through and um and looking at people's um ethnicity um and where they lived for areas of deprivation and we we looked at all sorts of indices as well and and i put that into our into our um application so i talked about the fact i, I can't remember off the top of my head but i think out of um 300 areas of deprivation where we were on that scale as well um as a town northampton and um and so i i broke all our membership down and answered those questions um i talked about um what our planned income was we we had um budgets set and what, what our planned income was and and how that our income had been hitted and i i sort of demonstrated that that to them um i gave them a breakdown of what our fixed operational costs were during this period um and and i was a bit cheeky because i i put down the fact that we had furloughed our staff with the exception of andy and i and a part-time admin person and um and all our hourly paid staff had been furloughed as well um and and i tried to link it into the fact that they were talking about the impact that we could have as have on our membership and um, because you know they wanted to know how we were engaging with our membership and and things like that so after i submitted the application um i got i think two weeks later i got a call from um, one of the assessors at Sport England, and the first thing she said to me was that we we can't we, we you can't put as part of your claim the cost for the coaches. So we had a bit of a discussion about that, and I said to her, "Look, there's two of us coaches. Uh, we're delivering and engaging with all all our membership, and um, and we need to keep our membership on board. Um, we've asked them to make." Some voluntary contributions or not voluntary contributions but we've asked them to continue paying some fees um, and um, and they they have to have value for money and um, and all of those kind of things but the assessor was sticking very rigidly to the criteria and, and, and the guidelines and um, so the biggest part of our fixed operational costs each month were um, the salaries which for me for me andy and our part-time lady and we don't earn a lot of money but it was a big a big percentage of of our fixed operational costs so i then said to her i said okay i said if you're only going to look at you know the fixed costs we've got which are things like um we we we've, we've got a photocopier uh we've got a, a landline we have a, a small office in the mount swimming bar so we've got we've got office rent and we've got those kind of things i said if you're only going to look at those i said can't you then multiply that by the number of months that the funding is meant to cover which she agreed to so we are uh, our original claim or not claim application was for nine nine thousand seven hundred and thirty pounds and um we got six thousand and seventy pounds or we haven't got it yet but that's what we've been awarded provided uh we sent in all the other stuff that they need which is basically a bank statement and a form fill it, filled in um for a back transfer and they said it will take up to 28 days for the money to come through so, so how much time do you think you spent on the initial application because um, we've had someone comment saying it's the length of time that's putting them off applying oh. yeah i i would say that gathering all the information together and putting it into some semblance of order is what is what takes the time and um, and what i what i do is i i look at the application form and then i 
I look at what the criteria is and, and try and write my answers around the criteria so that you answer what they want you to answer. And, and I tend to do that on a Word document and then I copy and paste it because it's an electronic form once I've got it tidied up and saying what I want to say. So I would say to, it probably took two or three days, but not two or three like solid, solid, solid days, but you know, over a period of two to three days just to answer all the questions and get it to the point. And, and a lot of that depends. Like I, I was, I was trying to make, tick every box and make sure, you know, I, I was looking for, for virtually 10,000 pounds really. So I wanted to be sure that I had ticked every box that they wanted ticking really, you know, and I could answer all of their questions. Um, but you can do it. Um, you can do it. It's, it's not hard. I've filled in a lot, lot harder application forms for like the community foundation or things you know things like that in the past so i don't think it's it's really hard you just need to um be clear on on what you spend what you know what your fixed costs are the things that you can't i mean basically they said to us um we can't pay you um, we can't contribute towards your cost because you should have been furloughed. So, um, and then, so then I talked to them about the engagement and they went, yeah, but that doesn't matter. So it, so it's a bit of a, you know, they want, they want people to engage and, but, but they don't want, they don't want the staff there to engage. And then, then you're limited on how much engagement you can have with your members because if you're not qualified fully as a volunteer to engage with your members, you know, if you've not got the, the qualifications, the insurance or anything like that in place, then, then you can't engage with your members. So it's, you know, that side of it wasn't great. And we, we did have a discussion around that. But I would say that filling the form in it's probably one of the easiest ones to do. And especially if you do it in a Word document first and then copy and paste it over. Um, because then you've, then you've got it in front of you and it's easier to sort of make the changes that you need to make. One downfall is don't use tables because they have to be reformatted if you put them into the, you know, into the electronic application. So try not to use tables really. Yep. And on the Sport England website, down, hidden away, right down the bottom of the webpage, is a list of the questions that they do ask you through the document. So it's worth scouring all the way down, so then that will help in the Word document to have that, rather than having to cross-reference all the way back to the, the, the portal to apply for there. And can you just let everyone know, how, how many members do you have within your club, or park? Hi. So swimming members um, said this question this morning. Uh, Sharpie, was it 245? Uh, yeah, two, in the actual swimming club, 245. So that's in, that includes masters, disability, um, development swimmers that are not old enough to compete yet and are competitive swimmers. So it's not, not that much really compared to other sw swimming clubs. I think, I think people two. think we're always a lot, lot bigger than we actually are. Yeah. So... I think for some of the other sports clubs, if you're going to be looking through some of the data around your participants, it could be a lot easier if you haven't got the 245 members to, to look for it, or even if you take a snapshot of some of the members to look at where they live based on your knowledge of the participants as well for it. But I think it's definitely worth getting to know your members but as part of the application process, which could help you with other funding pots um, as well as the Sport England one. There. Yeah, and, and when it came to looking at, at your members, somebody, so somebody else um, looked at that part. Um, Sharpie did some of it, didn't you, Sharpie? Yeah, I did that. Um, you asked me to go through yeah. Yeah. Um, our, our squads and identify all the, the um, fame and ethnicities and which people have got disabilities and different age groups, male and female split. So we, uh, Jackie did the bulk of the work and then she asked me to do Little, little parts of it to help help. Yeah, so so, so I, I, I put all the financial stuff together and, and Andy put together all the, um, you know, all, all the different, the groups 
and, and where we're based and the areas of deprivation and, and, and all that. And so, so if someone else gets that information for you, then really it's just fed into the document. Yeah, brilliant. So I think that kind of leads us on to the next slide, which if people want to unmute themselves or have got any questions to ask, feel free to ask those now and we might be able to answer or come back to those. So if anyone wants to unmute and ask the questions. Do you have anyone wants to? Yeah, can you hear me? My name's Nick. Hi Nick. Yeah, hi there. Uh, I'm the chairman for Kingsthorpe Jets Football Club. Okay, yep. uh, in Northampton. Um, on one of the earliest slides, you said about ineligible um, claims for new activities. Yep. Uh, we hold a annual uh, tournament every June, and this, this generates for us as a club around about two and a half to three thousand pounds worth of income. Yep. Which is a volunteer only run club is a lot of income for us. Now, this event was planned for, we'd actually already spent um, some initial money uh, in planning this event. Now, we've cancelled uh, the tournament this year. Would this still fall, fall, un, fall under the ineligible category? We've run this tournament for 26 years consecutively, so it's the first year we've not been able to do this for 26 years. Yeah, unfortunately, I think it, it does come under the ineligible area because it's not... I've had a look off Jackie, as though it could be different, uh, because it's not a fixed minimum running cost. Well, it does have a knock-on effect into your income. Yeah. But it, does, it isn't part of your fixed running costs for that period. The, the FA might have a separate pot that you can apply for through the FA. So it's, it's worth talking to them. I know some of the staff are furloughed. Yes. For it, so some of the FA pot. Jackie, did you? Yeah, yeah. Well, what the Sport England, because what the Sport England lady said to me, because as part of our losses that I put on our application form was for our open meet in July. So we, we always run um, a meet in July, which, is, which brings money in for us, you know, um, in much the same way that you do. So... Um, and it brings in very important income. And I put that down in, in our projected losses. And what she said to me was that um, whilst I'd shown that we had done this over the years and, and I'd shown, um, shown the accounts around that. So I'd said, you know, this was the income, this was the expenditure, this was the profit that we'd made over the last five years for each of those meets. Um, she said to me that we weren't, she couldn't take into account the fact that we might make because then I averaged it out over five years thinking that would probably be the scariest way of doing it you know and, and uh, but she said but what you could do is if you've paid so for example for us we pay for pool hire so for hiring the facility and if the facility aren't going to refund you that money you can you can put that down as a loss but it's not counted um it's not they wouldn't count it, you know, it wouldn't come into their calculation of what they were, go they were going to pay out on um, as, you know, we, so I put it down on, our, on my application that we'd lost, you know, I can't even remember now, but just say £6,000. And she said that you can't, you can't consider it to be £6,000 because you don't know whether people would have entered or, you know, or people would have, people would have come. So, um, but anything that you've spent, as long as you've got the receipts or invoices for, for that meet, for that tournament, you can put that down as a loss because that tournament's not going to happen. But you can't put the the profit that you were going to make as a loss. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Uh, we've had quite a few footballing clubs coming to us with similar... It's worth just talking to the FA, see if they've got any money set aside for, for similar issues. But I'd be surprised if they had. I think FA Football Club, towards the end of the season, may be looking at similar tournaments there. Yeah. Which is unfortunate timing. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. So, do we have anyone else with any questions or comments about that first section? If not, if you don't, feel free to email anything over afterwards or get in touch with us 
uh, about any other areas. Good, uh, so just going to move on to club matters and some practical advice for clubs. So on the Club Matters website, which is part of Sport England, they've got lots of great resources available to help you connect and stay in touch with your members and participants. Um, we've seen some great work from some sports clubs around social media, whether that's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, but only 65% of the UK population have social media and it's probably a lot less are active on social media. So think about how, how you're engaging with members uh, that aren't on social media. Uh, are you calling up some of your participants who are, you know, aren't tech savvy and making sure they're okay? Just a quick phone call um, might mean they'll come back in a few months' time. Uh, are you sending emails as well, or as well as just the social media posts? Then, are you looking at training up your workforce in different opportunities, taking that time to invest in them by signposting them to training courses? If you've got a club with a bit of reserves, can you fund them to go on some CPD courses during this time? Uh, have you moved any of your committee meetings to virtual AGMs or committee? I know from some sports organisations, Dave's has gone into complete shutdown. The committee's talking occasionally on WhatsApp, uh, but others are holding regular committee meetings to plan their restart. It's about trying to just keep some level of normality going for when, because I know some governing bodies have said that nothing will restart until end of June now, but that June will come around soon. Are you in a place? to be able to support members when they come back there. So we've heard some uh, clubs are open, planning big opening parties, barbecues, for the whole community to come together when they reopen. <clears throat> so not just holding those for coming members, but having us an open celebration of their facility, of their activities, to try and engage new members into that. I think when the lockdown end there'll be those tentative steps of people possibly wanting to have the social side and not not as much the physical so how are you going to engage people into your club setting through that and then hopefully get them involved in the physical down the line there with new members what have you done with your your membership have we've had some clubs that are because they've got fixed running costs have had to keep membership going some have frozen it um, some have gone to donations and actually then looking at gift aid onto the percentage of that when they've come in. So have you thought about that? How did you think about it? Did you ask your members what they would feel happy with or did you just make a committee decision and how are you going to build those back in at what stage uh, going forward? There forward. So some bits, a few practical bits of advice. Hopefully we don't come into this situation again, but it's an ideal time to keep good financial records of all the extra expenses you've had to occur through this time. So if, if next year we're in a similar situation, you've got an easy file you can obtain that's got your costs in there. You're not having to go through uh, lots of documents again, there to hand. Where can you reduce organizational costs? I was listening to Martin Lewis yesterday on the radio and he was saying that, as he normally does, his quick comparison website can easily save you money as a lot of the big six organisations are reducing their costs down to become more competitive. Have you looked at your utility suppliers for your facilities if you have them? Um, looking at your cash flow, where can you save the money on that? and keep in touch with us um, whether that is just a simple email asking a question that you wake up during the night thinking or something more structured where you want to book in a telephone call to have a chat we're there to support you for that so if any of you own your own facility 
maybe maybe common sense, but is the gas turned off at that facility? Has someone actually been down to check the gas is off? Have you sealed up the letterbox to your facility to make sure nothing can be put through the boxes because there's been increases in antisocial behaviour as part of the lockdown? Have you got an up-to-date list of the key holders? Have you checked whether your police or whether your insurance company need that list for it? It's amazing how many sports, sporting organisations don't know that their insurance policy needs them to provide the police with list of key holders. So it's worth just looking through your insurance documents to make sure you are ticking the boxes uh, for that. As well as the Sport England funding, we've got the other funding pockets are available. Which is open to any sports club within the county, you can apply up to 1,500 pounds for capital uh, cost of equipment. We've just handed out uh, 12,000 pounds last week to uh, organisations across the county for a range of equipment from some calisthenics bars through to pitch markings uh, machines for going around the football pitches. So there's funding there to support. As part of your analysis of your members, you could be identifying people from underrepresented groups to become potential coaches or members of your workforce. So we've got some coaching bursaries and workforce funding that you can apply for to support those members get onto the coaching ladder or become a better workforce for you within your club. Uh, satellite club funding. So if you're trying to engage more 14 to 19 year olds within your sporting organisation, there's funding there that I oversee that can support you engage those members. Northamptonshire Community Foundation have a wide range of funding pots that can be looked at there. Jackie mentioned earlier on there. And for Simon Homes, their Building Futures pot is available for there. With all of those, if you need have any questions about them, feel free to get in touch and we can talk you through those application processes and support you as you go through all that. Something else we're looking to do is hold some regular coffee and cake catch-ups with clubs, coaches, officials, anyone who wants, whether it's just an informal telephone chat with some other coaches. Uh, but we need, we don't want to just be coming up with the ideas. We want the clubs around the county to be telling us what they want. So on our website, we've set up a simple questionnaire where we're hoping the clubs and coaches can fill in the information to tell us what they want, when they want it for it. So it's a simple, just a little tick box there, whether it's for the club wanting a webinar and discussions around writing funding applications, planning for your return, or whether it's for volunteer coaches, it's about maintaining your mental well-being, discussing professional development that's available, so it will only take a couple of minutes for you or your coaches, club members to complete it, but it will help us shape the future of support going forward. They're both during these times, but across the year outside of this. And as well as the informal copy and cakes, we're looking at some possible two hour webinars, where it's a bit more in depth. We're looking at the introduction to legal structures, planning for your future, the whole participant experience within your club. Uh, so if you get time, just have a look at that website and fill it in, share it with your other coaches, other volunteers within your club to help us get the better picture for that. So a quick little task. Through, through the stuff we've gone through so far, write down one thing you're going to take away and do in relation to making your committee better when you restart or well, just give you a minute to have a think about that and then if anyone wants to share any of their ideas feel free to do so so just have a little think we'll have a look at some of the questions that have come in
So hopefully you've had a quick little thing. Does anyone want to share anything that whether it's through this or whether it's through discussions they've had previously about what they're going to do with their committee going forward to make it uh, a more functioning committee? Don't all shout out at one. I'll, I'll go. Yep. So it's Andy from uh, Northampton Swimming Club. Um, we've already had an online committee meeting uh, at the club via Zoom. Um, so we've already said that moving forward, we're going to try and do that more often. A, because we're going to cut down on commuting and travel time for people. If you have, you have an hour's committee meeting, it can sometimes be two hours or three hours, can't it, by the time you've travelled there and back. And these sorts of meetings, uh, you find a lot more people can attend especially for volunteer people that are perhaps working as well and it's going to be better for the environment cutting down on on travel and cars and things so that's one thing that, that we've that, that's been uh, good from the lockdown is the uh use, using zoom and all the online meetings brilliant anyone else from any other clubs had ideas or got discussions That's fine. It's something to go away and have a think about about what you can do. Matthew, I think, uh, Matthew. Hi, Jackie. I think uh, um, uh, Mike from Kettering Swimming Club brought up, he's going to find a fundraising officer from his committee. Okay, yeah. Which is a good idea um, for those, for clubs really, is to find somebody who's either looking at sponsorship, grants out there, um is really useful to have a fundraising officer in a club yeah uh, thanks jackie yeah it's, it's a role that we've had vacant for a little while now and I, i've been doing the uh, grant applications and have had quite a bit of success recently over the last year or so although we haven't applied for any of the uh, the recent coronavirus related funding um because we don't really have any ongoing costs so we're not making any we're not losing any income from this um, just one thing I did want to say, just in terms of communication, uh, we find obviously um, we, we communicate by email and that goes to parents of swimmers. We communicate by social media and that generally is picked up by parents of swimmers. So we sent out a postcard to, uh, to all of our members, so all of our younger members. So we felt we were communicating with them directly and it wasn't that expensive to do really. No, that's a, that's a good idea. Was it through the post then you just sent them out? Yeah, we used an on we used an online system, a company called Stamp S T A double N P, and so we we de we designed the postcard online. We uploaded the addresses that they were going to be sent to, and uh, and then they organised the postage as well. So, for about one hundred and sixty postcards, it costs about ninety pounds. Okay, that's not bad then, well, because all it takes is a few of them probably to return in. <coughs> Uh, when when they can and you've got your money back from that yeah good there that's a good use of uh, a different form of engagement because obviously like you said the social media most likely go to the parents and if there's some of the children like my daughter whenever anything comes from the post she's raised us to try and get it so we're there so that's good uh, so we're going to just now look at some bit around virtual sessions. We see some great virtual sessions taking place, but through discussions, we've been looking at how safe are they and do they meet your governing body's uh, safeguarding and coaching ratios for it. There. So, something that came up was that not all insurance providers cover you to do remote sessions if you can't see the participants when they're taking taking place so it's worth checking your own individual insurance or your club insurance to say does it cover me if i run these sessions it's an awkward one but if someone wants to hurt themselves at home and they say it was part of a structured club session who is responsible for that and who's insurance if a parent wanted to, would they look to claim through as part of a, a club session? Some insurers will only cover live video sessions 
where the leader can interact with participants. For it there. So as we go on to it later on, part of some of the bits around safe practice is around not seeing the participants when they're at home through the session. So just check in with your insurers where you stand on that. So looking at the safeguarding. Do you know and understand the safety features of the software apps you are using? Do you know where to report abusive and offensive content if you see something? Some of you might have heard about the incident in Scotland with the swimming where uh, some safeguarding issues came up. Who, where is that reported if you're using Zoom, if you're using Facebook Live, other platforms? Uh, who can access these sessions? It's always good to use a password or ID protected uh, session so then the general public can't get in. Are children and adults mixing within the sessions? As part of your normal club sessions, would you have children and adults taking part, taking part in those? Are the sessions appropriate for adults and children to be taking part in, in terms of the intensity of the activities? Uh, do you remind the participants to turn on and off webcams, microphones throughout the session? Is it, do you have it compulsory that people have their webcam turned on? What, what if participants uh, don't want to have their webcam turned on because um, they might be subconscious about where they live, what it's like inside their house, but then your insurance could say you need to see the participants to be covered. Have you thought about that? Uh, are you aware of how many participants you have in a session? If your coaching license covers you for one to 12 and you've got 16 people within your session, as well as that, are you in or out of your coaching um, license there? What is your, if you have pu your own public liability insurance, does that supersede it? Um, does your coaching badge mean you can do strength and conditioning work if you're doing circuit sessions. It's worth areas, it's areas to look into to make sure you're covered. We don't want to be scaring people, but you've got to be thinking about this in some of the worst case scenarios. And have the parents given permission for the children to take part in these sessions? Do the parents know they're being, in, being involved? Are, are the parents happy for them to be? Um, as part of a Facebook live workout? Do the parents know they've got Facebook if they're 12, 13, when they shouldn't be having it till they're 14? How have you structured it to make sure you've got your safeguarding in place there for it? Uh, making sure participants are wearing clothes at all times or that are appropriate for the activities and for uh, being on public show. Any chat uh, is kept appropriate and in line with your safeguarding policies. Uh, that people, if people can speak and message through the sessions, are they, is it suitable? A lot of the information is stuff you might not have even thought about when setting up the activities. You, you have them their best intentions, but in that worst case scenario, are you covered for that there? So around some virtual sessions, we've seen some great sessions take place. Has anyone got any tips on what they've done that's gone well, hasn't gone well? For it, areas that we've just highlighted that made you think about the sessions you're running? But if, if you don't want to speak now, feel free to email us in with any concerns that we can then help you look into to make sure that all the virtual sessions are safe and in, uh, covering all the bases there, because we don't want to be stopping the sessions but likewise, we don't want you to be having issues down the line uh, if something was to happen 
Floyd. So something as Northampton Cheers Ball we're going to be launching over the next couple of weeks is something called hashtag club plug. We want to be looking at working with the sports clubs across the county to be selling yourselves online through different parts. So have a quick little think of a writer idea of a way you could sell your club either online or through to a different demographic. And then if anyone wants to share anything, because when we do this, when we launch it, we will have some prizes for the best clubs in terms of who can produce the funniest, who can produce the one that gets the most shares, likes, or there. So have a quick little think. And then if anyone wants to share some ideas without giving away your winning prize or your winning club plug. Where can we get the information for that, Martin? Sorry. Uh, we're going to be sending information out over the next week to different clubs, organisations. Yeah. Um, on that. But we're giving you a bit of an early heads up so you can get your thinking hats on for that there. Because we've got our club portal that we want more organisations to be using there. So trying to link it in, in with that there. So... Has anyone got any words of wisdom that they can think of to sell their club and how they're going to do it? Or if not, I'll start picking on people. So, Sarah from British Triathlon, what have you got for your clubs? Hi, everyone. Um, what have we got? Well, I'm. this has just inspired me, so... Um... I'll definitely be taking this back. Um, yeah, we've been in discussions about this. Obviously, we don't want to be um, ahead of the game and, um, you know, not promoting clubs to go out, but giving clubs the idea that it's still it's safe to go out training. We're just waiting on the government guidance, really, to see um, what will happen for us next and what guidance we can give out from, from an NGB, really. But, yeah, I mean, it's great to hear things like this that are coming up from um, uh, active partners because it's something that we've had a lot of... Um We've had a lot of uh, queries about um, and worries about and concerns from clubs that they're worried that they've lost members because of how their membership um, is renewed. Um, so yeah, they're, they're looking for ways to um, get members back when this all kicks off again. So, um, so yeah, this is definitely um, something to take back um, for us. And um, yeah, hopefully we can get some of our tri clubs um, on board from North Ants as well in this. So I'll definitely be promoting it. Yeah, our, our, our Northampton Cheers Ball Chair is a member of Triathlon Club, so we'd hope, uh, to, okay. <laughs> we'd hope to get at least one back in. Steve. That's Steve, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah you've got one, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> so, any other sports Yeah, great club? idea. Cheers. Any other sports clubs got any ideas they might look to use? No, that's fine. That's fine. It's worth just having a think about and looking at ways, and for some of you that might not have the social media presence, how are you going to attract and recruit our members back in off the back of this? So a few useful contacts once again. There's, there's the Sport England email address and my own email address. Feel free to ask any questions you've got going forward, whether that is to do with coronavirus or anything in terms of club development in general please feel free to add, send those over to us we're here to support you and a few useful websites that it's worth looking at we're going to be sending these slides out so there's no need to write them all down straight away for it so before we finish do we have any questions from anyone who's here Have a look in the chat. Nope. So thank you all for joining us. Hopefully you've enjoyed it and take you've got something to take away. <coughs> Please feel free to ask and send feedback in to us about how useful you found this. And we'll speak to you all again soon. Thank you, Martin. Thanks, Matthew. Cheers. Yeah, thank Good you. Fun.
Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.